And she looked at me and she said, Good Lord, are you going to talk about all of that? <laughs> she wants to get out of here tonight. Apparently, no, no, no. There, we've got a couple other things in here other than what I want to talk about. But uh, when Kathy asked me to do a presentation about a fort, I told her, I said, you can't do a presentation about Old Fort. You have to do a presentation about Old Fort Township. Old Fort at all, but has always been more than the geographic boundaries of this town. And this evening, I'd like to start my presentation not here in Old Fort, but in Washington, D.C., at Ronald Reagan International Airport. There, I'd like for us to purchase and program a long-distance drone and enter the coordinates of 35 degrees, 43 minutes north, and 82 degrees and 10 minutes west. Then toss the drone up into the skies. As the machine moves south, southwest along the eastern face of the Blue Ridge, it'll fly mainly over the Shenandoah Valley. As it flies south, southwest, it will fly over many small towns. These towns share many things in common. History, economics, even religion. Yet each one is unique in its own right. And it's the unique character of Old Fort that I want to address this evening by simply asking one question. One question. What is Old Fort? When hearing this question, many words I'm sure come to your minds this evening. Town, community, agricultural, industrial, Railroad. When anyone thinks about Old Fort, what ideas come to mind? That's the question that I want to answer. I want to take this word wall and convert it into ideas. I guess that's the elementary teaching in me. To better understand Old Fort of today, it's actually necessary to understand Old Fort of years past. And that's my design for this evening. To honestly review Old Fort's history, it's necessary first to look at the area from the viewpoint of the Native American populations who used this area centuries ago. Historians and archaeologists tell us that just to the west was a large Cherokee nation, and to the east was a Catawba nation. Archaeologists have determined that three and possibly four trails bisected this valley at one time. And these were trading trails. They allowed commerce to move back and forth from the Piedmont culture of the Catawba to the mountain culture of the Cherokee. Despite local legends, there's no permanent, or there's no secure scientific evidence that a permanent Native American settlement ever existed in this area. But many locals have large collections of artifacts, arrowheads, spear points, and pottery that has been gathered in local fields, collected after spring plowing and rains. So the, def so the area has definitely been used by Native American civilizations. The European history in this area begins with families of Scotch-Irish immigrants moving out of the Tidewater Basin along the coast of North Carolina, across the Piedmont, and into the eastern Blue Ridge Mountains that we know today. As more and more immigrants left Europe and landed on the east coast of the United States, particularly in the area of Wilmington, they brought with them pressure, pressure to move west. Most of these immigrants were Scotch-Irish or lowland British. They were unable to compete 
with the plantation economies that have been established along the coast of North Carolina, South Carolina, and Virginia. So their only choice was to move west, westward across the tidewater, across the Piedmont, and toward the wall of the Blue Ridge. These settlers often followed the drainage basins of the great Carolina rivers. The land was much easier to traverse, and even today, highways still continue to follow those paths. King George III of England comes into play now. Even in old form, King George comes into play. King George attempted to calm the growing concern of the Cherokee Nation by ordering that no Europeans settle west of the Blue Ridge, which is right here. This order was never really taken seriously by the local colonists. These people were Scotch-Irish, and they did not follow the orders of a British king who happened to be from Germany. So it was only a matter of time before these two cultures, the Native Americans and the colonial Europeans, clashed. One of the first European families to move into this area was the Davidson family, led by four brothers, George, Samuel, John, and William. The Davidson brothers settled in this area, but immediately looked to the West themselves. They also led efforts to establish a stockade in this area, not a European-style fortress that we see in the movies, not anything you see in Highlander, but rather a small wooden palisade that would be used to protect local settlers. This settlement became known as the Davidson's Fort. John Davidson, one of the brothers, and most of his family were killed just east of here by an attack by marauding Cherokees in the summer of 1776. As far as we've been able to tell, the attack took place near where Lytle Mountain Road and Greenlee Road joined just east of Tamarine. This battle led to the Battle of the Fork in July of 1776. This battle occurred further east near what's now Burnett's Landing at Lake James. The colonial forces won the battle that day, but by sheer numbers, they wanted to retreat and rest. So they moved east to near Quaker Meadows, which is, not, which is now near Morganton. And here they awaited supply and reinforcements from the east. It was to this pioneer fortress that General Griffith Rutherford came with a force of about 2,000 colonial men. These men were used to lead an attack upon the Cherokee Nation in 1776 in the fall, after the Cherokee crops had matured, after they had been harvested, then the colonials attacked the Cherokee Nation. This attack effectively eliminated the Cherokee as a threat to the colonial war effort in the South. The stockade on the Upper Catawba, which was right here, was known by several different names at this time. One was Catawba Fort, one was Fort Royal, one was Rutherford's Fort, and finally, the name Davidson's Plantation. After the American Revolution, calm and quiet was the rule of the day in Western North Carolina. The Old Fort area was generally known as Davidson's Plantation, and it seemed that all that was happening in North Carolina was happening elsewhere, to the east. But progress was coming. It was working its way west out of the Piedmont in the form of the railroad. The Western North Carolina Railroad reached Morganton to a great celebration. This was a great event in North Carolina Railroad. But the railroad did not reach Old Fort and 
until 1869. The delay was in no small part caused by the Civil War and some financial irregularities among the directors of the railroad. It seemed like any time they needed money, they just borrowed from the railroad. And this caused some problems when bills had to be paid. Old Fort saw several of his male citizens serve in the Confederacy during the Civil War, even though they were subsistence farmers themselves, and very few of them owned slaves. Their graves are marked in local cemeteries with the Iron Confederate Cross, which can be seen today. As the war ended, a large force of Union cavalry under the command of General Alvin Gillum, passed through Old Fort not once, but twice on its way to Asheville. The troops were part of Stoneman's Raiders, which were sent into Western North Carolina to basically destroy the war-making effort of this part of the Confederacy. They had orders to seize and destroy anything which might be of value to the Confederate war effort. But General Gillum knew that the war's end was at hand. He knew that within days the war would be over. And he did not want to be known as the man who burned the homes of innocent women and children. So his troops passed through Old Fort twice in the summer of 1865, without causing harm to the city or out causing harm to the town. After the Civil War, there was a great deal of rebuilding to be done. The eastern and central parts of North Carolina were largely in ruin in 1865. And there was not a lot of political sentiment for rebuilding the economic and political structures of the state's western mountains. Those hillbillies out there didn't deserve what money there was in the state. The money needed to go down east. In fact, there was a great deal of political concern in Raleigh that the western part of North Carolina and the eastern part of Tennessee were planning to secede from their two states and create a third state in a very similar method to what had happened with the creation of the state of West Virginia just a few years earlier. The answer to this fear from Raleigh was to connect the western part of the state with the down east folks by a railroad. The purpose was to move food and industrial products west, especially food, and raw materials, mainly timber, to the east. An old fort was sitting right in the middle. At this time, one of old fort's most famous citizens appears on the scene. His name was Sanborn Worthy. Sanborn Worthy was one of the many young men who sought to make their fortune in the banker's south. He came to the area after the Civil War and he purchased 2,200 acres of land from George Davis, his grandson, with the hope that the railroad would build its repair and maintenance shops here at the base of the Blue Ridge. Werther chartered the purchase of the property with the state, and he planned to sell the properties to the railroad and its workers. He needed a name for the community, so he named his community Catawba Vale. But much to his dismay, the railroad decided to build its shops elsewhere, and Worthing was forced to declare bankruptcy. The charter of the town was appropriated by the state. The town was given a new charter by the legislature on February the 23rd, 1873. With a new charter came a new name, Old Fort and thus we celebrate 150 years ago this day. Following 
this event, the town grew slowly. Subsistence agriculture was still the main economic activity of the region, but times changed in 1905 when the Union Tanning Company opened a large tannery basically just across Mill Creek. This tannery processed animal hides that were brought to Old Fort by railroad from out in the west, from Chicago, and from South America by ports from Wilmington and Charleston. At its peak, the tannery employed over 300 workers in the building. Workers that had been on the farms. Now their life changed. They were workers in a building. Also, workers in the forest were cutting chestnut trees to supply to the tannery. At one time, the tannery had over 700 processing vats that were used to treat these animal hides. Problem was, on a windy day, you could smell Old Fort in Mary. <laughs> the people of Old Fort said it smelled like money to them, but the people of Black Mountain, Pleasant Garden, Sugar Hill, and Marion had another name for it. The tannery was struck by lightning in a storm in 1931, burned to the ground, and was never rebuilt. The destruction of the tannery and the effects of the Great Depression had tremendous effects upon Old Fort and the area. Government work programs such as the WPA and the CCC built the Mountain Gateway Museum across Mill Creek and the gymnasium of the recently rise Old Fort School on this site. In the early 1930s, the rural schools found around Old Fort were closed by the state. Their students were consolidated into the beginning of the Old Fort School that we know and celebrate today. And I know because I worked here today. <laughs> World War II took many of Old Fort's young men away from the mountains for the first time. They saw the world and returned to Old Fort. After the war, manufacturing became an important part of the local economy. The Old Fort Finishing Plant was known then as Clearwater, opened in 1947 and provided years of employment, not just to single men, but to families. Other industries producing furniture, hosiery, Automobile carpeting provided an attractive alternative to the pre-war agricultural economy, and the town grew at an unheard of and an unexpected pace. On August 24th, 1955, our small town received national attention as Luke Magazine recorded the efforts of Mr. Albert Joyner and five local students to integrate Old Ford Elementary School. Their attempt was unsuccessful, but changes were coming throughout the nation, not just to Old Ford. And today, Mr. Joyner and his brave act are honored by the name Albert Joyner Road on the street in front of his house, which is west of town. As I said, changes were coming, political, social, and economic life changed throughout our country. And Old Fort was not exempt from these changes. Local industries found it difficult, sometimes impossible, to compete with the onshore flow of foreign-made goods. This led to the inevitable. Old Fort finishing, which had been a part of so many people's lives for so long, closed its gates for the last time on July the 31st, 1984. Ethan Allen Furniture ceased production at its Old Fort location years later on June 14th, 2019. Today
Today, our old fort is not our grandparents' old fort. Gone are three of the four large industrial employers. The middle school and the high school are now located in Maryland. At one time, those from the east who wished to visit the mountains came along US 70 right through the middle of Old Fort and created some of the most mind-bending traffic jams that the world had ever seen. Today, these people and their descendants speed up Interstate 40 behind us here at 70 miles an hour and don't even know we are here. With all the history and these questions and these changes in mind, I want to go back just a second now to close with my opening question. What is Old Fort? With that in mind, I saw some help recently. I went to our fifth grade students, and particularly to Ms. Barbara Dyer, and asked her for some help. I asked her to ask her students for me, please take a piece of paper, and answer one question. Answer one question. What is Old Fort? I received a numerous stack of replies. Read them all. I read, it's where I live. It's a nice place. It's an old town. It's where my grandmama lives. I received one reply, it's on the top of my stack here, that I think says it best for everyone in this room. What is Old Fort? It's home. After 150 years, two words say it all. It's home. Thank you for coming. Please enjoy the remainder of your evening.